UN 영어 뉴스 Why Don Derillo is America's greatest leading writer? 더 라이터 더 인스파이어드 넷플릭스 레이티스트 히트 화이트 노이즈 이즈 데슬링 크로니클러 오브 몰던 아메리카 앤드 원 오브 더 컨트리즈 레전더리 노벨리스트 라이트스 존 셀프 에 브릴리언트 스토리 어바웃 데스 앤드 더 피어 오브 데스 said the original jacket blurb on Don Derillo's 1985 novel White Nose adding that the book is a comedy of course this month Noah Baumbach's Netflix film of White Noise dazzles its way on to our screens and we are promised a fascinating, invigorating spectacle, a thrilli thrillingly original blast of cinematic luster. So this feels like a good time to look again at White Noise's author and consider why Don Derillo is one of the great novelists of our time. He published his first novel in 1971 and for half a century has been one of those writers who makes us think in a new way. Read him for long enough and the world begins to look different. Derillo's early novels were about things, advertising, Americana, 1971, Sport, and Joy, 1972, Rock Music, The Great Jones String, 1973. <laughs> Later in the 1970s, he began to grow and experiment more. Lovers like Rattler's Star, 1976, Players, 1977, and Running Dog, 1978 were playful, intricate, and increasingly uninterested in forcing Derillo's talents into standard literary forms. They meshed up elements of science fiction, thrillers, and satire with big brain subjects, astronomy, economics, social history, and they started to weave him a reputation. There's Norman Mailer, there's Thomas Pinchon, now there's Don Derillo. Gasped the Los Angeles Times on the paperback cover of Running Dog. But it is widely agreed by his admir admirers that the next stage of Derillo's career rang in what we might call his imperial face. It is on the five-book run of the 1980s and 90s, the names 1982, White Nose 1985, Libra 1988, Mao 2 1991, and Underworld 1997. The Derillo's colossal reputation stands. These books are still about things, yes, but they also are the things themselves. Highly self-aware literary works, recreations of modern society, so intense that they make us see it afresh. Intensely Derillo-esque books about an intensely Derillo-esque world. Let's take these five books and see what it is about Derillo's right that makes him stand out among his contemporaries. In the names, one character says he can see a shape in the chaos of things. 
What else are books for? Get white rose. Another says, I want to immerse myself in American magic and dread. Look no further. The names exemplify Daniel's first quality, his ultra modernity, his often seen as a visionary, a prescient writer who saw what's coming. But really what he does is observe what was really always there and focus on it. The names is about Americans abroad, mostly in Greece and the Middle East. Everything about it is so thoroughly up to date that you can see why Georg Dyer called it a 21st century novel published in 1982. Its characters have more than hard to describe jobs. The narrator, James Oxton, struggles to say what he does for a living. Generally, I do reviews, I examine figures, make decisions. It's a world where the US is the country that is always okay to hate. There's no sense of wrong when you kill an American or blame America for some local disaster. A world where then as now, the price of oil was an index to the Western world's anxiety. It told us how bad we felt at a given time. In the names, Delilo also noted, noted the rise of terrorism as a focus of the Western world's attention. The plot features a sect that kills people based on their names and in a horribly prescient take on the extremes of human appetites. One character wants to fill up the murders taking place. In 1982, of course, there was no social media, but the group think it harnesses is summarized in the names too. Masses of people scare me says one man. People driven by the same powerful emotion, even in his earlier novel, 1977's Players, Derrillo spotted what few of us had, that New York's World Trade Center Twin Towers were as much symbols as they were real objects. The towers didn't seem permanent. They remained the concepts no less transient for all their bulk, bulk than some routine distortion of light. When, in September 2001, Al-Qaeda treated them as such a symbol, Derillo acknowledged that today again, the world narrative belongs to terrorists. Connected to this modernity is the next key quality of Derillo's his restless curiosity about the world. This is poet's best scene in his 1988 novel, Libra, about Lee Harvey Oswald and the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The seven seconds that broke the back of the American century, Derrillo decided early on to name the novel after Oswald's zodiac sign. I was hoping it was Scorpio, because I liked that word. But his first sign turned out to be Libra, the scales. I settled for that. He also noted that a motivating element in writing novel might have been that Oswald and I lived within six or seven blocks of each other in the Bronx. Libra went in on the ground floor of an industry, the JFK conspiracy theory industry, that others, including Oliver Stone, JFK, and James Alloy, American tabloid, would go on to explore and exploit. 
Read word that it was Delos' first bestseller. It engages full throatedly with what Delos says. The JFK assassination opened up what has become unraveled. Since then is the sense of a coherent reality most of us shared. An observation which could have been written the day before yesterday with our filter bubbles and self-reinforcing social media silos. This engagement with the outside world renders Delillo somewhat unfashionable in an age of autofiction and the internal stories with no moving parts. He had done it before, too. His debut novel, Americana, 1971, touched on the manipulations of what would later be called reality television, and he would do it again on the world. 1997 takes on more or less everything that happened in World War II, the U.S. in the second half of the 20th century. And Falling Man 2007 was inspired by the collapse of the Twin Towers. In all these books, Delo is interested not just in these aspects of the world, but in what is hidden from us. The American mystery deepens, he wrote in White Nose Noise. Indeed, White Nose is a fine example of Delilah's engagement with the world. The list in the list that fills its pages emphasize just how crammed our lives today are with this stuff. The stereo sets, radios, personal computers, the cartoons of phonographic records and the cassettes, the hairdryers and the styling irons, the controlled substances, the birth control pills and the devices. And the White Nose 1985 is the perfect way to highlight the next of Delilah's qualities, the dazzle of his writing style, the fact that his novels are smart, idiosyncratic, and sometimes challenging works about big things shouldn't distract us from the point that they are a blast to read. All Delilah's books offer something nutritious in every paragraph, but White Rose might be the most stylish of all his books. The story about a college professor who teaches Hitler studies takes aim at modern life, consumerism, paranoia, technology. It's full of riffs and jokes. California deserves when whatever it gets goes well. Californians invented the concept of lifestyle. This alone warrants their doom. It satirizes our reliance on devices and our deadened responses. The smoke alarm went off in the hallway upstairs, either to let us know the battery had just died or because the house was on fire. We finished our lunch in silence. In white noise, people talk in advertising slogans and savor the bad news that saturates the media. Only a catastrophe gets our attention. We want them. We depend on them as long as they happen somewhere else. But in the book, suddenly there's a local catastrophe. The urban toxic event which spreads a crowd over the area, leading to mysterious evolving symptoms. At first, they said skin irritation and sweaty pumps, but now they say nausea, vomiting, and shortness of breath, and creating bizarre conspiracy theories. The murder of white noise 
like watch of Derelos mature work is postmodernism, fragmented, subjective, layered with extra literary elements, the words that come from the TV and radio are presented like dialogue, as though those devices are characters, fully paid up members of the household. The TV said, and other trends that could dramatically impact your portfolio. The self-referential media mesh of Derelos world, where brand names become a mantra. The working title for White Noise was Panasonic, but he was refused permission to use it. Makes perfect sense in the 21st century, where our experiences are endlessly processed, photographed, commented on, reshaped, and shared. It's a world that has seen, as the British writer Gordon Bond put it in his book Best and Edwards, The Electronic Society of the Image, the daily bath we all take in the media, replace the real community of the crowd. Images, in fact, are key to Derelos' writing and exemplify the force of his distinct qualities, the coolness of his world view, as seen best of all. In Mao II, 1991, the title of the novel comes from Andy Warhol's silk screen prints of Mao Zedong, which he flattened and replicated one of the world's great tyrants into an image of colorful celebrity. It's very Derelo-esque that Warhol said of his mechanized approach to art. The reason I'm painting this way is that I want to be a machine. In Mao II, a reclusive novelist, Bill Gray, who has become famous for two books written decades earlier, is struggling with whether to publish his third. He is also aware that writers no longer change things. The future belongs to crowds rather than words, Bello argues, we are driven by the power of the image, usually of great and horrifying spectacles. The book is structured around tele televised images of, among other things, the Hillsborough Stadium disaster and the Ayatollah Khomeini's funeral, to be shared in the grief of those suffering. When we witness such events, one character wonders, where are we boy warriors? There is vision never flashes, never looks away, which may be why his, his work can seem cold in its unsentimental approach to human horror. We see in the names, filmy terrorist murders, in white noise, separating Hitler from his actions through the academic fetish of Hitler studies, in falling man where the book is centered on the iconography of one of the men who jumped from the Twin Towers. His books live on cults and deaths and mass murder, which are a part of life. Life must become more anxious, more surreal, more image-bound, says a correct character in Mao the Second. Once again, they lost so but was coming. And this takes us to the last of the attributes that help to give Delilah's work its significance. His willingness to keep going is exemplified by both Underworld 1997 and what came after it. By the mid 1990s, Delilah's reputation was secure, but he was ambitious to write the sort of book nobody thought he, him inclined to write. 
were indeed capable of a monumental social history that foregrounded character as much as event. That such a book could come from a writer who has never made an outline for any novel that I've written never seemed extraordinary on the world represented an expansion of talent that encompassed baseball, the bomb, the Cuban missile crisis, real people, and the invented ones that left critics open jawed in awe. There is no doubt that it renders Derillo, a great novelist, wrote Martin Amis. The epilogue of Underworld even reflects on the internet in a way that makes the metaverse seem like a twinkle in the author's eye. Is cyberspace a thing within the world, or is it the other way around? Which contains the other, and how can you tell for sure? Not bad for 1997. Yet, what might be more significant for this factor is what Derillo did next. Since Underworld was published 25 years ago, when the author was 61, a career summation, if ever there was. Derillo has kept on going. Since then, he has published a further six novels and a collection of stories. These novels have been different from what came before, shorter, mostly, and tighter in focus. The Body Artist 2001, one of the best, is a strange sort of ghost story with sentences, poems, unmatched in pure stylistic beauty throughout Derrillo's oeuvre. In these books, he continues to engage with the modern world and to explore themes familiar to his readers. Cosmopolis 2003 features Wall Street protest. Point Omega 2010 brings together war and filmmaking in classic Delilo style. And two years ago, he published his latest work of fiction. The Silence, more novella than novel. This was not a major work. At the age of 84, you are entitled to have your best work behind you. But The Silence feels like his most timely story yet. Set in 2022, it features a communications blackout, where phones and screens go blank and the people are locked down together. Unwisely, an editor at Derillo's US publisher inserted a reference to COVID-19 into the book to try to make it more contemporary. Bad idea. It wasn't going to stay. That's for sure, said Derillo. And not only is Derillo still writing, He's still doing the publicity rounds, still turning up to promote his books when a writer of his stature could sit in silence and let the novels sell themselves. He ob 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 obligingly meets the press with every new book and practically every Q&A styles itself oxymoronically as a rare interview with Don Derillo. I've been called recursive a hundred times and I'm not even remotely in that cat category, he said in 1992. You see, Derillo doesn't need to address his reputation with mystery and silence as a lesser writer might. He's the opposite of Bill Gray in Mao the Second, the novelist who maintained his own mythology by disappearing after a short run of success. At one point in Mao the Second, Bill says 
Do you know why I believe in the novel? It's a democratic shout. Anyone can write a great novel. One great novel. Well, not quite anyone.